Hi, I'm Timothy Koth. This is Timothy Ponter, and this is James Crutzler. We are standing in the CERN Physics Laboratory at Rutgers University in New Jersey, next to our 12-inch cyclotron that over the past 15 years we've built out of spare, surplus, and donated components. Undergraduate, senior-level physics students use this as part of their modern physics laboratory. The purpose of this video is to show you our cyclotron, all of the subsystems necessary to make it work, and how it can be used in, as an educational tool. First, we'll start by removing the chamber and opening it and looking at the internal components of the cyclotron. About a dozen electrical, vacuum, and gas hookups located around the chamber must be disconnected, and the three leveling feet on which a chamber sits lowered out of the way to free the chamber. Once the high-voltage D-stem is disconnected from the RF matching box, the chamber can be carefully slid out. The chamber is light enough that one person can carry it over to our workbench. Twelve screws hold on the aluminum lids. Typically, we only have to remove the top lid to service the internal components of the chamber. With the cyclotron chamber open, I'll give you a tour of how it works. First, let's start out by going over all the components inside the cyclotron chamber. At the very center, you have an ion source. This is a penning ion gauge type ion source with two cold cathodes, one on the top and one on the bottom. There's a chimney that spans the gap between the two. And the small hole in the chimney faces the D where the ions are injected into the D. The D is this D-shaped brass electrode. It is hollow and it permits the ions to travel inside without being interrupted. The D is electrically isolated from the vacuum chamber and is supported through a copper rod out the back side on a uh, ceramic vacuum brake. Around the chamber, we have a vacuum pumping port. We have an RF pickup probe that monitors the voltage on the D. We have an electrostatic deflection channel that peels the beam off for analysis. We have the service leads for the ion source and a service flange. We have a viewport that views this phosphor screen on the end of a radial probe, so we can slide it in at any radius and intercept the accelerated beam. We have another viewport which allows us to look between the accelerating gap, between the D and this dummy D. We have a vacuum gauge port, and we have another vacuum pumping port. The chamber itself is a stainless steel, three-quarter inch thick wall with an O-ring groove for vacuum sealing. This cyclotron accelerates protons in a spiral path that's ever increasing in energy until it hits the final energy of about one MeV. Timothy Potter is opening the top part of the ion source. He's going to inspect to make sure that the cathode hasn't flaked and caused any shorting. It'll also allow you an internal view of the construction of the source. There's a tantalum cathode button and a uh, center conductor that goes up through a ceramic tube to bring the high voltage. And the copper provides a grounded cap. All right, well, part of the routine maintenance is to change out the phosphor screen. It, it gets burned due to the beam hitting it. So we have a few spares. Here's the one I've just taken out. You can see the damage from the beam. The phosphor screen at the end of the radial probe is electrically isolated from ground and is connected to an electrical vacuum feed-through so we can measure the incident beam current. A similar phosphor screen is located at the end of the deflection channel. Since we burn them up so quickly, we have gotten into the business of making our own screens. Okay, so we, uh, we've replaced the phosphor screens, and we're going to put the lid back on and seal it up. To ensure uniform compression of the O-ring, we tighten the lid screws following a star pattern. Okay, so Tim Ponter and myself are removing the screws that hold the pole tips in place. So we can remove these pole tips, uh, and we are going to install a set of weak focusing pole tips. The spiral pole tips that are being removed were designed by a recent group of cyclotron students. We have just finished testing the pole tips with beam, and I'm happy to report that they work nicely. However, to demonstrate our standard cyclotron operation, we are replacing them with a set of weak focusing pole tips. These were also designed by a previous group of our cyclotron students about 10 years ago. Each pole tip is only held on by four bolts, so as you can see, we can easily change the pole tips, allowing us to experiment with many different magnetic field configurations. The Rutgers 12-inch cyclotron gets its name from the 12-inch magnet that we use to bend the ions for the magnetic resonance or cyclotron acceleration. The pole tips are actually 12 inches in diameter, but the maximum radius that we use is about a 5-inch radius. The magnetic field comes from energizing the magnet 
by passing a current through the top and bottom coils. Most cyclotrons have the coils wired in series to have exactly the same current in both. However, this being an educational machine, we have two power supplies which independently control the upper and lower coils. So now we'll take a look at the RF system. The RF voltage that provides the acceleration starts out with a signal that's generated at the low level synthesizer. The synthesizer provides 7.8 megahertz in our case today in either a CW or continuous fashion or in a pulse mode for pulsed RF operation. The low level signal is supplied to the RF auto tuner which keeps the cyclotron's resonant circuit on resonance. The signal continues out and supplied to the buffer amplifier which provides about 100 watts of drive for the 1500 watt power amplifier. The output of this amplifier comes back through this heavier coaxial cable into the RF matching box where externally wound is a, uh, an inductor that brings the cyclotrons D into resonance at 7.8 megahertz. Now that the chamber lids have been put on, Tim Ponner and Jim are going to return the chamber to the magnet gap, now outfitted with the weak focusing pole tips. Installing the cyclotron chamber in the magnet is pretty much the reverse order of operations as removing it. Two precision monument blocks, which are bolted to the chamber support frame, reproducibly locate the cyclotron chamber horizontally. The D-stem is then carefully slid into the RF matching box, and the dozen electrical, vacuum, and gas connections have to be reattached, the trickiest being the high-voltage connection to the deflector assembly. The three leveling feet that support the chamber can easily be adjusted by eye. Now that the uh, chamber has been installed in between the pole tips and it's connected to the vacuum system, it's time to warm up the vacuum and rough out the chamber. So the first step is to rough out the vacuum chamber to bring it down to about 10 to the minus 3 tor from atmosphere. While the vacuum chamber is being roughed out, we'll start warming up the diffusion pump. This process takes about one hour. I start by turning on the water cooling. You can hear the solenoid and the water flow. I have to enable the vacuum system through the programmable logic controller machine interlock protection system. With all the safeties and interlocks made up, I can begin pumping with the mechanical pump, open up the safety valve, and turn on the diffusion pump heater. Now we sit and wait for about an hour. Time for lunch. We've come back from lunch, all the while the vacuum system has been pumping on the chamber, and the chamber pressure is in the low minus six range, 10 to the minus six tor. And that means that's sufficiently good to start operating the cyclotron. All of the atmosphere has been pumped out, all of the contaminants to a good enough degree have been removed, and we can start accelerating protons. But before we do that, we must fill out a daily run log sheet and this is what we fill out, the date, the operators, brief description of the run, information about the magnet water cooling, the vacuum system, and the RF system. And also that we're accelerating hydrogen. So the first step in turning on the RF is to enable the low level RF signal. We have 7.8 megahertz, we're plotting it on the upper trace of this oscilloscope, as well as the upper trace on this other oscilloscope. The bottom trace is the signal from the RF pickup in the chamber. So the first stage is to turn on the buffer amplifier. And we can see that we have a sine wave. We'll increase the vertical gain. So you can see that better. We'll go to the auto tuner and adjust the capacitor on the chamber for maximum response. Now we are tuning the cyclotron tank circuit onto resonance. And we're doing this at a modest power of about 10 watts or so. So even if we did have a large reflected amount of power, it wouldn't cause any damage. Now, we can turn on the uh, main power amplifier. But before we do that, we need to turn on the RF cooling oil, which cools the tank circuit coil. And now, we'll bring the oscilloscope trace back down to a low vertical amplification and engage the RF amplifier. And it's instantly you see a jump in amplitude on the D voltage. And that's because we're putting in about 100 watts of RF power. 
Again, I will rescale the oscilloscope and increase the drive. So we're putting about 250 watts. It's about 10 kV in the D. Before I go any further than that, any higher in D voltage, I'm going to turn on the magnet and bring it up to just a few thousand gauss. And that corresponds to about 5 amps on the top and bottom coil. With the power amplifier operating at a modest 250 watts into the chamber, I will again just quickly sweep the tuning capacitor and it shows that we are right on resonance. Now I will engage the auto tuner and you can see it drifts a little bit so I have to adjust the phase knob to bring us back on resonance. And once I let that go this analog circuit will automatically regulate the resonant frequency by a motor coupled to a vacuum variable capacitor continuously adjusting the capacitance to keep the circuit in resonance or on, on resonance and you can see that the motor is turning counterclockwise and clockwise back and forth. I have the gain set pretty high so it's always fidgeting. The dead band is very small. So the RF is set and now we can comfortably increase the RF power to a much higher level and feel that we're going to stay on resonance. Now the magnet is on but operating at a low magnetic field. The RF is on operating at a RF voltage sufficient for acceleration. What remains to be done is to fire up the ion source and then adjust the magnetic field to satisfy the magnetic resonance acceleration or the cyclotron condition. I will hand the ion source controls over to Timothy Ponter. So the first step in operating the ion source is you want to make sure that you have a sufficient flow of hydrogen. Uh, you do not want to turn on the source without a uh, sufficient gas flow. So the way we do that is we have a, a tank of hydrogen right here. So we will open the line and charge, pressurize the the short length of tubing that goes to the mass flow controller and then we can close the bottle off. The residual pressure in this line is sufficient to operate the cyclotron for a few hours. Uh, we make sure that the mass flow controller is set to a reasonable value. Right now I have it set to a value of 104 and, and then finally once we make sure that that's set, come over here and turn on the hydrogen valve. So you have confirmed that you have sufficient hydrogen gas pressure to operate the ion source and there is sufficient current flowing in the magnet, then it is time to activate the high voltage to the uh, ion source. First step is to turn on the ion, uh, high voltage power supply and activate the high voltage. This, uh, this power supply is set to operate in constant current mode, so I will set an initial startup arc current of about 10 milliamps. Next I will slowly raise the, the voltage until we see uh, a rise in the, in the current and a drop in the high voltage and that's a good sign that you have achieved a, a good arc in the ion source. Okay, so we have the power supply went into uh, constant current mode. We have a sl uh, small rise in current being supplied and the voltage did drop. So now we, we should have a sufficient arc. We should be making beam. Tim, could you turn off the lights so we can confirm that? And looking into the viewport of the vacuum chamber, we can see a glow coming from the ion source and we are making beam. So now that the cyclotron magnet is on, the RF is on and the ion source is operational. All that remains is to scan the magnetic field until the cyclotron resonance condition is met. So we should expect to see a Q over M of 1 or a proton peak at about a half a Tesla. But we will sweep up clearly through one Tesla and we should see an H2 plus peak as well. And that would be molecular hydrogen with a Q over M of 1 half. Okay, the pen is down. Initiate the ramp.
So we see some ion response there, but we're not at a half a Tesla yet. So about 13.9 amps, and that is the proton peak. So we've just gone through the proton resonance condition. Magnet current is about 20 amps in climbing. I'm going to change the scale on the electrometer. We're at 23 amps. Now we're starting to enter the region of iron saturation. So we are getting smaller increments of magnetic field, which we are plotting on the horizontal axis for an increased amount of current. 27 amps. Twenty-eight and a half. Thirty-one amps. And there it is, that is the H2 plus peak, the successful acceleration of molecular hydrogen. And we've gone through that resonance condition. So we're in excess of one Tesla. Thirty-eight amps. And we have achieved forty amps, which is one point two Tesla in our magnet. Now that we've completed our B field scan and we've identified two cyclotron resonance peaks, we're going to narrow in and investigate the uh, proton peak. So what we'll do is we'll turn the magnet to about 13.8 amps, which is about a half a Tesla in our magnet, and we'll adjust the magnetic field to optimize the beam intensity. Then, just to confirm that we have a Q over M of one particle, we'll turn on the high voltage deflection channel and look at the phosphor screen at the end. If it is in fact a Q over M of one, the particles will make it to a phosphor screen and we can see it on the monitor. So I'm going to head over to the high voltage power supply now. Okay, next I will turn on the high voltage power supply for the deflection channel electrode. It will slowly ramp up the high voltage while we look at the phosphor screen at the end of the deflection channel. And when we get to the right electric field, the beam successfully makes it down the channel and onto the phosphor screen that we're viewing. If I increase the voltage even further, I can push the beam right off of the screen. So I'll bring it back down and center the beam on the screen. And that is right at 12 kV, which with the cyclotron operating, we can view the beam by inserting a phosphor screen into the path of the beam. Right now, the phosphor screen is all the way at the, at the edge, allowing the beam to go into the deflection channel. However, I can insert it and intercept the beam at any radius and look at it. By sliding the beam in and out, I can view the beam at any radii from the center all the way out to the edge. Setting up a camera for a long exposure we can paint that image in and see what the beam is doing actually along the radial direction. Three, two, one, pulse. One of the modes of operation of the cyclotron is an RF pulse mode. We've been able to uh, increase the peak forward power tremendously by a factor of 10 or even 20 but firing very short RF bursts. Here, we're firing a pulse that's in excess of 1,000 watts into the cyclotron tank for about 50 milliseconds. The upper trace on the oscilloscope will show the RF envelope, and the bottom trace will show the beam current on a beam collector.
three, two, one, pulse. So I'm adjusting the magnetic field to optimize beam current, tuning for peak beam current on the Faraday collector. So I've gone through the peak and I'm coming back. And that's optimized. We have developed a PLC or programmable logic controller based interlock system that will shut down the cyclotron quickly if an unsafe situation presents itself. The PLC based system has been devised by Jim Kretzler who will tell us a little bit more about it now. We uh, want to show you the machine safety system that we put together. It's based around a programmable logic controller. A uh, programmable logic controller was selected and used for this because it's a very robust simple straightforward piece of hardware that performs a job that performs it well. What the PLC is looking at is some various inputs from around the entire cyclotron, making decisions based on these inputs and driving outputs. The inputs, as you see, starting from the left side, read switches on cabinet doors, the RF enclosure. They bring in contact assemblies from the water flow sensors. So when water is flowing, we have a closed set of contacts. We also monitor, monitor temperatures at various locations, four places in the cyclotron, on coils, diffusion pump, mechanical pump. And if any of these temperatures drift out of the pre-programmed range, we get an alarm condition. When all of the safety devices that we're monitoring are in, uh, in a proper working state, you'll see a green light displayed for each one on the top. If any one of these items should have an issue, uh, loss of water flow, or somebody inadvertently opens an RF cabinet door, you'll see a red light. And in the program that's been written in place in the PLC will follow a, a list of instructions and execute uh, a proper shutdown of selected devices. As you may know, shutting down certain devices out of sequence can cause more damage or more harm to the cyclotron or the equipment than if they were left running. So the shutdown is important based on what actually happens. So what we're going to see is uh, if we had a loss of water flow uh, and possibly we could just simply shut the water off from the city and we show a loss of water and right away the PLC is detecting that there's loss of water, so we have loss of cooling, something can dangerously overheat, and we've restored water before we went through the timeout sequence, but once a short amount of time has elapsed, the outputs will be shut down in sequence, turning off the equipment and bringing the machine to a safe state. Now, it's important to keep in mind that this was not designed for human safety, this was designed for limited safety of the, the equipment and the cyclotron itself. And we're going to stop the water for a more, than, more than a preset amount of time. You're going to see the water alarms. And then on the right hand side, you're going to start to see the output switched off. Right now, everything is still in the on state. We have a little window of time. And we lost our water flow and we shut off various devices. Keeps our cyclotron nice and safe. I hope that you've enjoyed your tour of the Rutgers 12 Cyclotron and gained an appreciation for how complex but yet easy it is to operate. I should mention that one of our primary concerns is personal safety and if there's an unsafe situation that the operator observes, we can instantly hit the emergency off button and that's how we're going to end this film by shutting down the Cyclotron by testing out the emergency off button. We are producing 1 MeV protons and we are no longer producing 1 MeV protons. Every system has safely shut down. Thank you for watching.